There are millions of people in slavery, more people enslaved today than ever before in the history of the world. And two million of those are children forced specifically into the commercial sex trade. Hello and welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz and today is True Crime Tuesday. So I'm going to touch on a hot topic today. It's a topic that a lot of people don't want to be a hot topic and frankly it shouldn't even be a topic at all. But yet here we are, human trafficking. Now when I say human trafficking, many people's minds are going to possibly be going to somewhere like Eastern Europe or Asia where teens or children even are being sold for work or even worse, sex slavery. But for my local listeners in the United States, you may be surprised to learn that it is also happening here. And not just your stereotypical illegal housekeeper or nanny type situations, but straight up child sex trafficking is happening right here in the good old land of the free. And what is so shocking to me personally is how hush hush we have been about it. So today I am going to tell you a story about a little girl and her brother who were victims of human trafficking. And I found this story after watching a movie called The Sound of Freedom. Now, The Sound of Freedom had some issues getting released. It was actually completed in 2018, but when Walt Disney acquired 20th Century Fox, the film ended up getting pulled. Eventually, the filmmakers were able to reacquire the rights and went on to work with Angel Studios, making the 2023 release happen five years after the movie was actually finished. Isn't it interesting how some of the most important and critical issues in today's society just get put on the back burner like that? Why do you think that is? And I'm not going to touch that one today, but it sure is something to be thinking about, and you really should be. So The Sound of Freedom is definitely a movie worth watching, but it shares the story of two children who were trafficked and what ultimately happened to them. I will elaborate more as we go on, but for now I am going to tell you the story, and we are going to look at it from the viewpoint of Rocio. Before I tell it, I would like to say that this story is going to touch on human trafficking, including the rape of young children, and that I tried to keep it as tasteful as I could while getting the point across. But there really is no way to keep this topic tasteful because of how just straight up awful it is. So please be advised of that as I continue. Thank you, and here is Rocia's story. Hello, my name is Rocio. I'm seven years old. I live with my little brother and my father here in Mexico. We don't have a lot, but we get by. One of my most favorite things to do is sing, and the most amazing thing happened to us today at the market. I was singing as we were shopping, and a beautiful woman approached us and told me that I had the most amazing singing voice and that she thought that her agency could really helped me become something. <sighs> you don't even understand how excited this makes me and tomorrow me and my brother are going to audition together. <sighs> I don't know why they're letting him audition as well. I mean, he's five and he can't really sing, but she said she could tell we were both special. My dad wasn't so sure, but in the end, he always tries to get me what I want and what's best for me. So tomorrow we are going to the audition and I can't wait. This has been a dream of mine since as early as I can remember. I couldn't sleep at all last night. I was too excited. I woke up smiling, singing and dancing around the house. And my dad just smiled and called me his little princess. The day could not go by any slower, but finally we make it to the hotel where we are going to audition and I am so nervous, but also so excited. There are some other kids here too, maybe around 12 of us all together. I smile at a girl my age, she smiles a little and kind of just looks down. 
My dad has a quick chat with that beautiful lady we met at the market and she lets him know what time to come back for us. He gives us each a hug and tells us to give it our all and that we are stars no matter what. And then he turns and heads down the hotel hallway. We are escorted to our seats to wait for the audition to start. After two more kids come and their mom leaves, the pretty lady tells us one of the first things that we need to learn how to do in this business is to travel. She talks about all the beautiful locations that we could end up, the lavish lifestyle, basically everything I've ever dreamed of. So the first thing we're doing is changing location. Okay, this sounds like fun. We get into two vans and 15 minutes later, we are at another hotel. This one isn't quite as nice, but I'm trying not to worry too much. I don't know, maybe it's just the nerves about the audition. <laughs> We all file into a room, but there are some more people there, and they're looking at us in a way that makes me even more nervous. Before we sit down, we're giving some numbers to put on our shirts so it would be easier for them to call us. The nice lady is pretty calm. She tells us we are about to start soon, and my brother looks up at me with these worried eyes that I really don't know what to do about. I'm nervous too and not even sure why he is here, so I whisper it will be okay and I slip off the necklace I'm wearing that has the Bible verse from Timothy on it and I slide it around his neck. He smiles. There. The necklace says man of God on it, so I clasp his hand and tell him no matter what happens today, dad will be proud. Then I hear my number. Seven. I look down to make sure, okay, I'm first. I smile and stand up and the beautiful woman tells me I'm the lucky first contestant and leads me out of the room we are in to the elevator. She tells me that the auditions are private to make us more comfortable, which seems really nice. We go down the hall to the room that is really just a hotel room. There is typical bed, camera set up facing it, and there is a man there with us. After she brings me in, she nods to the man and says she's all yours. He smiles at me and I try and smile back, but something in his eyes frightens me a little. Okay, this is not what I was expecting, but I do want him to like me. Aren't you beautiful, he says. I smile. Thank you. Okay. I guess this is going well. What are you going to do for me today? He asks. I'm going to sing. Okay. He is adjusting the camera and then he looks up at me as if he's waiting for me to start. So I start singing the only song I remember my mom singing to me when I was three. And as I'm singing, he comes towards me and brushes my hair back, which makes me really uncomfortable. I try and continue. He just grabs me and starts kissing me not like my parents do, the way married people do in the movies, and I'm so surprised that I scream, and when I do, he slaps me hard across the face so hard that I fall, and when he fall, he picks me up like I'm nothing and just throws me on the bed. I scream, but he punches me across the face and says that if I scream again, they'll kill my brother, and after that, I just close my eyes bite my lip and pray that God will hear the screams that I can't stop on the inside. <sighs> this is exactly what my dad told me is not supposed to happen, and yet no one is here to stop it. No one is stopping them. <sighs> Finally, he shudders and looks at me, and when he sees my face is turns to disgust and he slaps me again. I was trying so hard not to get slapped again, but I don't know what to do, so I curl into a ball as he gets dressed and storms out of the room. I don't move. I don't know what to do. Every noise I hear makes me jump and it hurts every time I do, until finally I can able to cry myself to sleep. I miss my dad. I miss my brother. I just want to go home. I wake up to being grabbed and shoved in the shower by this time a different man. I don't want to talk about everything the men did to me, but some of them were nicer to me than others were. All of them touched me and didn't care that I was a kid, and I never said anything because I knew they could kill my brother. 
I prayed for him every night and that my dad would save us soon. I knew he would never give up on us. This time I wake up to being grabbed and shoved to the door and into a car. They tell me to be a good girl, do what they say and my brother will live. I'm trying so hard, but I seem to keep upsetting them. So I try to just be quiet and look out the window. This was different. Maybe I was going home, finally. I knew I had to be strong for my brother Miguel, so I stayed quiet. But when we got to the border, there was a man who asked my name. He was wearing a necklace that looked exactly like the one I gave to my brother. I don't even know how long ago now, and I just blurted out, Rocio Aguilar. And he said, you're safe now, as six more agents surrounded the car I was in. There were three other children riding with me. The agent told me my brother gave him that necklace the day before when he was also saved. And that his name was also Timothy. <sighs> Couldn't get through that without choking up there. Oof. Now, if you have seen the movie, The Sound of Freedom, you'll recognize that I told Rocio's story slightly differently, and we'll get into that in just a little, but the main reason is because for the movie, they combined a few different cases to tell Tim Ballard's story in a short enough version for it to be an actual movie. Here is a quick clip of Tim Ballard talking about how he rescued Rocio's brother, Miguel. Um, but thousands of hours of watching children being raped. And then, and then rewinding and watching again to describe it for the court or for the, you know, for the, for the prosecutors. It's, you know, and then, and then seeing the kid and you had, and you're, now you're with the kid and you're like, oh my gosh. And, you know, I had an experience once with, um, with a child. It's actually depicted in The Sound of Freedom. So it's a real scene where the child, I was seeing this child, um, who I had already seen the videos of him being raped by the pedophile who's driving the van. And he gets stopped at the border and they get him out. And, I, and I, I'm one of the first on the scenes. And, and at one point, he's five years old and he's being kidnapped from Mexico. And the guy who's kidnapping him is, has, a, has a basically child porn studio in, in San Bernardino, California. Yeah. And um, anyway, so I, I get this. He jumps into my arms. In fact, that's the scene you see here at NRB. Mm, yeah. The, the Jim yeah. Holy, that's, the, that's the actual scene from the movie where he jumps out of the van and I'm holding him. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Holy crap. And then he tells me about his sister and um, his sister's being trafficked. And he gives me this necklace. This is a real story. And, the, and when you get Santa Freedom, there's a, he's, you, even in the trailer, Caviso's always holding this necklace. The necklace is real. It's, it, I actually told the producers to consider not telling the story because people won't believe it. But the little boy gave me a necklace. It was a necklace that was like a rosary, like a prayer to him. And um, the necklace had my name on it. Wow. Uh, it was because it had a little scripture, 1 Timothy 6.11. And when I saw my name on it, he gave it to me, even though I was trying to give it back to him. It, it, was, a, it, it was like a calling. Now, in the movie, Tim goes on to quit his job, start a nonprofit, and ultimately go on a pretty large manhunt that includes busting up an underground pedophile ring and infiltrating a rebel army in the jungle to rescue Rocio. In real life, I couldn't find a whole lot on Rocio's actual story other than that she was rescued 24 hours after her brother was rescued in real life. To me, this would indicate that it took place in a similar fashion, but I was unable to verify that for sure. It seems like both she and her brother's names were changed for the movie as well, I'm sure out of respect for the victim's privacy. Her character was developed to combine the story about her and her brother and the locket that he gave Tim Ballard with another major case that Tim Ballard worked on about a boy named Grady, who unfortunately still has not been rescued to this day. Ballard states that the villains portrayed in the film are all based off of people that he has had to deal with in real life, including the woman who was portrayed helping traffic Rocio and Miguel. In real life, the character in the movie Giselle, who scouted and trafficked Rocio and Miguel, was based off of a real person named Kelly Joanna Suarez, who was known as Miss Cartagena. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. 
She was a former beauty pageant queen who became a human trafficker and used her position to recruit young girls who looked up to her. She even had appeared in a music video for a Colombian artist who had won 20 plus Latin American Grammys. She was one of the real traffickers that was actually apprehended in Operation Triple Take, just like in the movie where they save 54 children and capture all of the traffickers involved. This did actually happen and sources say that it was actually lowballed. There will be a documentary coming out detailing everything that actually did go down called Triple Take. In the movie, the whole thing maybe took up to 15, 20 minutes of screen time. So that will be really cool to see when it comes out. And there were 120 total trafficking victims rescued in this operation, the rest of them being adults. So this film, along with being stalled for release, caught a lot of criticism for not accurately portraying how the majority of human trafficking takes place. And I'm sorry, but the fact that this film can happen and be a compilation of true events is just so grossly disturbing that whoever, who cares? Who cares if this is not normally how human trafficking occurs? It's terrible it happens at all. Yes, it happens in broad daylight every day, primarily among people who know each other. My point is that it should not be happening at all on any level, but the fact that this movie was able to be made off of true events is just horrifying, and it all needs to be stopped. On top of all the other criticisms that were flying around, there was a tabloid that reported that Tim Ballard had used his position and manners that were unbecoming and even used the term sexual misconduct, so I did want to touch on that as well. One such report was that Ballard had sent a picture of himself in his underwear and had asked one of the operatives how far she was willing to go for the operation. Now this is pretty dicey here, because <laughs> honestly I can see where this question can be twisted very easily. Obviously it was taken and run with in a manner that paints Ballard as abusing his position to hit on women. Frankly, he may have, but what if he wasn't? Really though, if he wasn't being creepy with me about it, how far I would be willing to go for an operation in this line of work is a completely valid and frankly imperative question to ask. Here's a quick clip about Tim talking about this type of partnership. ...that we use that involves female operators. Based on the allegations that are flying around and the questions being asked, we've decided to tell you these tactics. While I do so, I'm going to pay homage, respect, love and gratitude for these female operators who serve such an important role in rescue operations. You need to understand that children don't just fall out of the sky. They don't fall into your desk. It's a very proactive work. So if I am a man or one of my operators approached by a trafficker trying to put a child to, to, to service on that person or a sex worker, and that man, that operator doesn't partake of what's being offered they lose credibility, and so we came up with a concept that we call the couple's ruse or the couple's tactic, where you go in together pretending to be a husband or a wife or boyfriend, girlfriend. Now you go in, and one of you could, could pretend that, yes, I, I want to partake in this sex act with this woman or this child, but I can't because my girlfriend won't let me, but maybe we can do it later. So is that cool? Like, let's keep talking and, and she'll warm up to it eventually. But the bottom line is we block for each other. So the trafficker sees the situation, recognizes that I have every excuse not to partake. Hundreds, maybe thousands of children have been rescued using this amazing tactic. Ballard also stated evil pedophiles will stop at nothing and they have allies in the government, in the media, in big corporations, and even in public institutions. They continue to lie and attempt to destroy my good name and defame my character, and they will never stop. Either way, he stepped down from his position at Operation Underground Railroad, his nonprofit organization, in light of these allegations, so that the organization can continue to do the work that it does without that getting in the way. My thought is that he just doesn't give off that vibe to me, but I've been so wrong about lots of guys in my past, so I don't know. The organization has also been accused of blundering missions that were aimed primarily at gaining video footage. Just all these accusations flying around. Um, 
I, I, I don't know. I wish more focus could be put at the real issue at hand is, is my thought on it. I mean, what do you guys think? There is just so much to everything about these stories that strike me as bizarre and disturbing on so many levels. They say that humans are the most valuable resource because they can be used and reused and cashed in on over and over. So one way I want to become involved is to possibly share some more human trafficking related stories on this channel. I would love to share more stories and help to maybe bring more awareness to this issue. Um, if you personally have a story that you would like shared on this channel, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll leave an email link right here and maybe include a subject like human trafficking story so I don't miss it. My thought is that the more people talk about it, the less easy it will be to ignore. So. I'd like to try and be louder. I'll be looking for some stories, but if you do have one that isn't out there that you'd like shared, feel free to reach out to me. And that is going to do it for today, but as always, let's try to end on a more positive note. So for today's feel good highlight, I am going to share another bit about Tim Ballard and his family. This was posted on February 19th, 2021 on his Facebook and it reads, Today is the anniversary of the rescue of 28 children from a false orphanage or shell organization in Haiti that was selling children for ten dollars to $15,000 each. It was special for a couple of reasons. One, it was Operation Underground Railroad's first preventative strike, meaning none of the children had been sexually abused, though they were for sale to any possible disgusting buyer. Our operation prevented more severe abuse. And two among these children were two that I especially connected with and ultimately by orders of my beautiful wife, we adopted. As there were no birth documentation for the children, the Haitian government decided to assign the date of their liberation as their birth date. So happy birthday to these 28 beautiful children and especially to my two kids. I love you two so much. You have changed our lives forever and brought a light to our home that I could have never imagined. Until I see you guys again, please stay safe out there and if some of what we talked about today got you upset, I strongly encourage you to see how you can get involved. I'll leave a couple of links in the description to get you started and let's go. What if this was your daughter? Of course in Britain and and that's wonderful, but in some ways, it's, it does us a disservice. Mm -hmm. We get a false sense of security that it's that it's it's dead. It's not dead. It's illegal. Yeah, that's great. Finally, it took it, it took 350 years for the United for the America even before it was a country. Right? It was it was already slavery was already here. Um, why it took that long is is horrific and grotesque. Mm -hmm. But it finally it finally you know um, it finally er eradicated. Um, and I'm not saying that the modern day form of slavery is worse than the transatlantic 19th century uh, slavery. It's not, um, it's all bad. <laughs> right. But the, the, the point is, and the people need to wake up to is, you could add up all the people who were enslaved over that 350 years of period of time that we call the transatlantic slave trade, and you can add them all up and there's more people alive right now in slavery than all of those combined over 350 years. Yeah. It's close to 30 million people are, by most estimates, State Department, UN, that are in slavery, either slave labor, sex slavery, or organ harvesting. And sometimes if it's one, it's gonna be the other anyway, eventually, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's horrifying, it's horrific. Um, the United States government and most governments aren't, aren't making it the priority that it should be. I think there's five drug agents to every one you know, anti child trafficking yeah. agent, let's, let's switch that because I'd, I'd rather save a child than seize a pound of cocaine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so we're trying to get loud and, and, 